So, um, I suggested that we watch these two talks, um, both, not well, different from one another, but both for, about the same topic, which is the way that the two sides of the brain, the two cerebral hemispheres, um, work, <laughs> um, how they um, relate to um, our knowledge, what the ki different kinds of um, consciousness, if you like, or the different kinds of thinking, you can say that, um, that these two cerebral hemispheres, uh, how they work. And it's really very striking um, in, in, the, in both, actually, you saw um, images of the brain. One, you saw a real brain, <laughs> which is quite dramatic, and how very sharply divided it is. You know, that this is large mass of the two cerebral hemispheres, and um, only at the very base of those two is there a join between them. Um, there was a few, um, I think in the 1970s, an article that I read a philosophical article um, about uh, people who had had that connection between the two halves of the brain cut. Um, and very strange things <laughs> um, are observed. Um, I won't go into all the details, but it seems clear that each side of the brain um, is able to function. Um, in fact, there are some people whose left or right hemisphere is completely disabled for, for life, and they are still able to, to function. Um, but they work in different ways. They seem, uh, to put it very crudely, they, they, they think differently. And um, as Ian McGilchrist says, you know, that, 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 that this has got a bit, a uh, topic which is very hot in the, particularly in the 1970s, I think, has got less fashionable in psychology because um, a lot of the generalizations that people used to make about the left and right hemispheres um, were not really correct. The left hemisphere, the right hemisphere was said to be the visual hemisphere and the left hemisphere, the verbal hemisphere. It's not like that. Um, both are involved in both. Um, but what it seems is that the big difference between them is that the right hemisphere has to do with holistic thinking, divergent thinking, um, taking in um, a complete scene um, and uh, somehow um, generating an awareness of that scene as a whole. And the left hemisphere is about analyzing details, convergent thinking. It's also about um, sort of pragmatic thinking, you know, um, problem solving. Um, whereas the right hemisphere is much more like an intuitive uh, a way of, of dealing with the world. Um, and Jill Bolte Taylor talks beautifully about the uh, the different experience of those, and how the, the the left hemisphere is very busy. It's concerned with past and future. It thinks about the past. It's got all those memories, and then it's also got lots of plans and expectations about the future, and it's manipulating those and trying to construct our ideal future and and how we're going to make that happen. Whereas the right hemisphere is absolutely in the present moment um, and it doesn't concern itself with past or future at all, it's not really aware of that at all, um, but it's very, very aware of what's happening right now. Whereas the left hemisphere has almost no awareness of that because all it's doing is thinking about, it's using information from the past to plan the future. <laughs> um, and um, I don't know if, if all, how many of you know um, uh, Eckhart Tolle's teachings and, and his book, The Power of Now. At the beginning of that book, he talks about um, his uh, enlightenment experience. I think we can call it that. He doesn't use that word. But um, for the benefit of those who don't know the story, he was a Cambridge academic, um, a literature I think he was a research fellow actually, he was 
fairly much near the beginning of his academic career, but obviously extremely bright um, and very intellectual. And he suffered a great deal from depression, which is relevant. Um, he says that, he, you know, he, he had this continual conversation going on in his head and it was stressing him and upsetting him. Um, and one day he was walking along the, the street in Cambridge and there was a woman coming towards him who was talking to herself continually. Uh, and nowadays it wouldn't attract any attention because he would assume she's on a hands-free mobile phone. But in those days, you know, this was something unusual. And, and, and he looked at me and thought, oh, goodness me, you know, she's pretty far gone. You know, um, uh, the kind of uh, the, the snap judgment that people used to make about anybody like that who would talk to themselves all the time in public is that, oh, they're mad. You know, they have a mental health problem. Um, and he was saying, oh, that's terrible. Uh, and he got to the college and he was in the toilets of the college and he was washing his hands. Um, and this conversation was going on in his head. And he suddenly realized, he looked in the mirror that he was talking out loud to himself. <laughs> My God, it's happened to me, you know. Um, so he had this obsessional inner conversation. He couldn't stop all the time. And one night uh, he was sitting there with this going on this you know a, a, a obsessional thoughts going on and he couldn't stop and he, and, and he had the thought i can't live with myself any longer and he said the next thought was well if i can't live with myself there must be two of me and maybe one of them isn't real and at that moment he said everything changed and you know that conversation completely stopped and he had a different experience altogether so profoundly different from anything he'd ever experienced that he was subsequently unable to remember it at all and after some hours he kind of came back down enough to be able to recall what his experience was like and he said everything was totally different it's like he'd been living in a black and white world and gray world and now everything was suddenly in vibrant color the conversation that was going on in his head had stopped and he was experiencing joy in the present moment and he said he was uh, in this state of uh, euphoric bliss for about two years um, he dropped out of his 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 college job he said he was uh, you know spending his days and nights on park benches in a state of continuous bliss and gradually, you know, he um, began to reconnect with the world and started looking at spiritual teachings and eventually became a spiritual teacher and wrote The Power of Now, which is one of the best selling spiritual books of all time. And what I'm, what I'm leading up to is the main message of The Power of Now is that through a learning to um, bring our awareness completely into the present moment, um, we can let go of all of our anxiety and fears, we can experience joy, we can, um, you know, uh, uh, essentially, you know, this is, this is I mean, he, he, he now does talk about enlightenment, that, that his uh, more recent book um, called Stillness Speaks is, uh, is, is, is subtitled A Guide to Spiritual Enlightenment. And in that book particularly, you know, he's, he's giving instruction how we can quieten down and silence the conceptual mind that continually thinks in words about the past and future, is always making plans, has all kinds of anxieties and fears about the future, all kinds of regrets and resentment about the past, and is not connected with what is actually happening right now. And an observation that he makes, which I think is rather important, is that although the conceptual thinking mind, which here we're talking, this is connected with the left hemisphere of the brain, um, is able to do very, uh, it's very adept at doing mechanical calculation and deduction, that kind of logical thinking, if you like, reasoning. But if what we might call creative intelligence, it cannot do at all. Um, that is a function of the intuitive mind, the right brain. Um, and it is there in only in the present moment that we can move our thinking beyond where it's been before. Otherwise, all we can do is apply what we think we already know to, uh, you know, uh, working out a new answer using that information. 
but the information that's coming to us right now in the present moment, we can't access with the left brain at all. Um, and <laughs> there's a beautiful example in Ian McGilchrist's talk, um, of people, it, because it's possible to experimentally deactivate one side of the brain. So you can do experiments on people and find out how they respond to different things. Very interesting, some of the experiments he talks about. And one of them uh, is where people who've had their right side of their brain deactivated, so this is the intuitive side, the holistic thinking side, um, they're shown cards with logical syllogisms, right? And asked whether the conclusion of the syllogism is true. So the example he gives is, all monkeys climb trees. The porcupine is a monkey, therefore the porcupine climbs trees. And invariably, people whose left hemisphere is working and their right hemisphere is not working, they say, that's true. Porcupines climb trees. The same people, when you ask them separately, do porcupines climb trees? They say no, because they have that information, they know that. And then you say, but well, what about this? Um, and they're a bit puzzled and they say, but that's what it says on the card. They cannot see the problem. The problem is that the second premise, of course, is false. It's not true that the porcupine is a monkey. <laughs> but they don't see that. They see that the argument is that, 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 is that the syllogism is correct. The conclusion does follow from the two premises. They don't see that actually one of those premises is correct. But anyway, what I'm getting at is they, they can reason mechanically, but they can't criticize their own reasoning. Now, this seems to me to have a lot of bearing on the present situation in the world. We're talking about the ecological crisis that, that we were talking about before. Whether it applies especially to the, the, the present crisis with coronavirus is an interesting question. We might want to discuss that in the discussion. Um, I think it does, but it'd uh, be interesting to see what people think. But uh, with the ecological crisis, it's like, well, the way that we've been doing things the kind of structures that we've created, and structure is very much a left brain thing, um, don't seem to allow us to respond to the situation that we find ourselves in, that our industrial activities and other activities are destroying the natural world. Um, and we have a problem, we, 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 as a species, we're not adapting because, uh, and I think there's, this is not of course uh, an absolute, uh, generalization it's not the only explanation but a big part of the explanation um, is that we are stuck in left brain thinking um, and we are using um, uh, information and ideas and, and, and knowledge that we have from the past to solve problems that are occurring in the present that are different in, in nature in order to solve those problems we need our right hemisphere to be in charge. So the book, Ian McGilchrist's book, uh, The Master and His Emissary, um, the title is taken from this story that he gives. I thought it was a Chinese story. He says it's from Nietzsche, um, uh, that there's a, uh, a wise spiritual teacher who um, is also the ruler of a kingdom, essentially. You know, and and, and um, he realizes that he needs some help. He needs to delegate some of the work to somebody else. Um, for whatever reason, perhaps he needs to go and find into meditation or something. I'm <laughs> not quite sure. But anyway, or maybe it's part of the kingdom. I think in, the, in one of the story versions of the story, it's a part of the kingdom that's a bit remote, and he sends this person off, um, who's quite knowledgeable and you know and, and, and experienced and so on, uh, to look after that part of the kingdom. And after a while, this emissary, the person he sent out, um, starts to think. You know, he has the wisdom that the master has and he takes charge without kind of consulting the master about things and things all start to go badly wrong and the analogy that he's making is what we've done the left brain um, which should be the servant of the right brain and there's a quote from einstein i think to that effect einstein said the rational mind needs to be the servant of the intuitive mind so um in our civilization now Ian McGilchrist makes this point quite strongly, you know, that in our civilization, essentially, we have made the right brain, the left brain, the master, uh, put the left brain in charge. And the left brain, as I've said, cannot critique its own thinking. 
and it works with representations of the world. It creates a representation of what's going on, but it can differentiate between the representation, the map, if you like, and the actual um, reality, the, 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 the landscape that the map is a map of. Now, they're totally different. A map is not a piece of territory. <laughs> it's very clear, isn't it? It's not a physical landscape. It's a picture of it, it's a representation of it. But the left brain cannot uh, differentiate those. Uh, the, the conceptual mind um, confuses its own concept, its own mental image or, or um, uh, idea of reality with the reality itself. Whereas the right brain experiences reality essentially directly. So in meditation, um, it's very interesting, isn't it, when we think about this, that, that what we do uh, typically in meditation is we use various techniques such as watching the breath and so on to slow down and quieten down that uh, analyzing, thinking, conceptual mind and allow our awareness to just be what it is and to notice what's, what's happening and uh, and also to be aware of being aware if you like so that state of being that state of consciousness i would say is very strongly associated with the right hemisphere of the brain um and i've just been actually um doing some reading of the perfection of wisdom sutra I wanted to get back to the um you know this is really where the um teachings of emptiness um, the Mahayana teachings of emptiness emptiness of all phenomena not just emptiness of the personal self but emptiness of everything really comes from this uh, sutra the series of sutras we know the heart sutra which is the the, the smallest one i'm reading the longer one and um what it seems to be constantly you know directing you towards is the conceptual mind's representation of reality is not real what the conceptual mind apprehends as reality is not reality and reality is empty devoid of those characteristics particularly things being separate from one another and the individual of course the personal self being separate from other personal selves and from the rest of the world from phenomena okay so the right um, hemisphere as Jill Bolte Taylor describes so eloquently and, and beautifully I think you know it does not experience reality like that it experiences itself if you like although it doesn't distinguish between itself and it experiences just being part of of, of, of being one with this whole this 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 the, the, she, she talks about you know the the energy of the i am the energy of the universe <laughs> um in a particular form of course but you know um there isn't a differentiation between me and that okay there's no what we call duality dualism the right hemisphere experiences reality non-dualistically. So in meditation, I think a lot of the work that we are doing is um, attempting to connect with that right hemisphere form of experience. Um, and as I say, I think, you know, Eckhart Tolle's teachings are a very good example because um, he had this dramatic you know shift which is not altogether uh, you know uh, uh, different from what how jill bolte taylor describes her experience where her left hemisphere was completely deactivated she only had the right hemisphere he didn't have that you know his left hemisphere was still able to kind of do you know uh, basic um, practical things which the left the right hemisphere on its own cannot do that if you have a a, a, a left hemisphere so stroke so drastic that your left hemisphere is put out of action completely you can't really do much um but 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 certainly he had had 
you know, that uh, one of the things I haven't really said, but it, it's obviously implied by a lot of things that I've said and those other people have said, is that at times the left hemisphere is dominant, it's in charge. And at other times, the right hemisphere is in charge, is dominant, particularly in the uh, says, um, and, and this is very clear, when we are in a situation that is very new, that we haven't experienced before, the left hemisphere cannot access its banks of information and try to figure out what to do. So it has to give way to the right hemisphere, which responds, is able to take in the situation, that this is what's happening and this is how I need to respond. And so the right hemisphere becomes dominant. And we notice that if we go to a foreign country that we've never been to before, especially if we can't speak the language, you know, we have a very vivid experience of, of, of being present. You know, everything's kind of, oh, bright colors. We, you know, we, we remember very strongly what happened because the right hemisphere is active, being aware of what's going on right now. We're not just caught up in this, um, uh, enmeshed in this uh, sort of matrix of um, my, my history and my plans for the future and how I'm going to put them into practice and you know uh, so that we're just not aware of what's going on right now you see what I mean so um, we have uh, we alternate between left hemisphere and right hemisphere dominance and also Ima Grosses points out as a civilization we do the same thing by the way I just mentioned you know his book is in two parts it's a long book and it's extremely worth reading it's a difficult book so you know if you want to make do with the the, the, the soundbite version the, the talk is brilliant summary of what the book says but the book itself is about seven or eight hundred pages and it's in two parts and the first part is about the psychology and physiology of the two sides of the brain in great detail because he did many years of research on it. But he was originally uh, not a scientist, he was a humanities person, he was a literature specialist. And the second half of the book is all about the history of European civilization and culture considered from this point of view. Um, and he writes about how the great civilizations, you know, the Greek and Roman empires and the uh, civilization of the Renaissance in Europe, began with an explosion of right hemisphere thinking, creativity, integrative thinking, holistic thinking. And gradually over time, it got more and more dominated by left hemisphere thinking until that creativity had got lost. The ability of that civilization to respond creatively to new situations was lost and the civilization disintegrated and collapsed. And I think it's very clear that this is the situation we're in now. Um, and I think that at, at that time, I think as a response to that crisis situation, creative thinking and, and more spiritual modes of awareness begin to have a resurgence. And so these are, I think, this, um, you know, uh, uh, understanding or this, um, I mean, it is, uh, none of these things are, um, to be taken as dogmas. <laughs> Dogma is the province of the left brain. So, you know, if we can get, we could get too stuck in having this idea, oh, everything's about the left and right brain. We have very fixed ideas <laughs> about what those are. And then of course we're in a left brain mode of thinking, we're gonna get into trouble. So we need to keep this fluid and flexible and recognize it's just one way of looking at things. But I think it's an extremely useful and insightful way of looking at things and looking at the situation that we're in now. And I will come back to that uh, next time, because next time I'm going to talk about um, Gaia, the Gaia theory, which is a holistic view of the, um, the Earth, uh, the ecosystem, um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the interaction between the physical world and the system of life on the planet, and how we can think of the system of life as one integrated whole, like a single organism. That is a very right brain idea, but of course, you know, the interesting thing about it is that it's come from pure science. Um, I mean, some people think it's a kind of fluffy sort of um, alternative um, um, kind of new agey idea but it is based on very, very tough, rigorous scientific analysis as well. So it's actually perhaps, you know, one of the areas where the left and right brain are coming together. Now they clearly need to come together. 
And just one final point that I was interested in, the, you know, we, uh, we started at the beginning by saying the, um, how very strongly divided the two hemispheres of the brain are. And there's just this small um, sort of um, connecting tissue at the bottom. And he says it's 300, uh, Jill Bode Taylor says actually that it's 300 million um, cells, axon cells of, of um, nerve cells of the brain, which is a tiny number compared to the whole to total number of cells in the brain. Um, and that, according to Ian McGilchrist, those, that, that, those connecting fibers have been getting less and less in proportion to the size of the brain throughout human evolution. It's very interesting. This, you know, we've been getting, our brains have been getting more divided over time. But it seems to me that the spiritual work of moving towards enlightenment is, if we look at it from this point of view, is very much to do with integrating the two sides. So first of all, you know, um, activating and uh, the, 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 the right hemisphere mode of awareness and, and quietening down the left so that we can get into this uh, awareness, direct awareness of reality without uh, concepts getting in the way and confusing uh, what is reality and then integrating the two sides together so the other that's ultimate truth obviously then conventional truth we know this is about the detail of everything um, and how we uh, you know how we practically act in the world integrating those two so compassion and wisdom uh, compassion is interesting mentioned by Joe Bolte Taylor, uh, who, who, who really does um, speak in very Buddhist language about her experience, isn't she? Um, you know, and that's interesting. Um, I think it was kind of an enlightenment experience. And she seems to me to be a very enlightened person. Um, so, OK, I think that'll probably do for the time being. Just, you know, I thought that was interesting that our brains have been getting more divided. Not sure quite what that tells us but i'll leave it there and we can open that up for discussion i'll just pause the recording there